to tell us more about our next health issue that we're talking about, about where are we going from here in this global fight against cancer, which at least is making some progress. The Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Global Drug Development from Bristol Myers Group, Samit Harawat, MD, and the Associate Director of Business Development at Bristol Myers Group, Claudia Genero. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Claudia Genero, and I'm a scientist at Bristol Myers Squibb. And I'm really excited to be here today, joined by Dr. Samit Hirawat, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Global Drug Development at BMS. Today, we're going to speak about a disease that unfortunately has probably touched many of us, either directly or indirectly, and that is cancer. We're going to speak about the global impact of cancer, the advancements in conquering the disease, and access to the latest therapeutic innovations. And of course, we're going to seek insights from Summit's 20 years career journey in this area. Welcome, Summit. Well, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And of course, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I do want to give a shout out to my colleagues from BMS, the contingent that is here. So thank you, thank you. And you touched on a very important subject, and we are here to talk about cancer. Uh, maybe just with a show of hands, as Claudia said, many of us are impacted by cancer, either directly or indirectly. Could you raise your hand if you've been impacted by cancer directly or indirectly? It's, it's amazing, right? Uh, I had recently seen somewhere that if there are 30 people in a room, the likelihood that two people have the same birthday is going to be about 70%. But when you see a room like this, the likelihood of 80 or 85% of the people having the impact of cancer on them is, is amazing to see. There are about 10 million deaths in a year that are related to cancer, which means one in six deaths are related to cancer. But even more unfortunate part of it is, as you heard this morning, in the low and middle income countries, that death rate is about 70% of, uh, of, of those 10 million. So there is a long way to go, but there is, it's not all doom and gloom. A lot has happened, certainly since the time when I became a doctor to where we are today, a lot has changed, and certainly this will be our topic of discussion today. Thank you for the intro, Summit. Um, before we fully jump into the topic of today, I'd like to begin by asking you a little bit about your background and your career journey. In fact, um, I know that you and I share something in common, and that is that we both left our home countries to pursue opportunities in medicine elsewhere. So I wanted to ask you if you could share a little bit of that experience and what motivated you to become a physician. Oh, sure. Yeah, you have uh, something in common because uh, you come from Bolivia. I come from India, I was born over there, and I grew up over there. Um, when you come from a middle-class family in India, uh, at least it was true then, I don't know now, uh, 35, 40 years ago, uh, the destiny was decided by the parents. There were three choices. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, or you could be an engineer. <laughs> so my destiny was written by my parents, but the destination was mine. And that destination came with a few of the drivers that I do have, that I carry with me. I always had the drive to go deep and learn. I had the drive and the purpose of trying to find solutions for patients. And then I had the drive to solve challenges. And becoming a physician has provided me with those opportunities that I can actually live up to those promises that I've made for myself to go deep, to help people, and to be able to solve challenges. And because I wanted to have the broad impact in the society, I chose to go in the field of drug development, and that's where I get my satisfaction now. Now, you and I understand the drug development process well, but for the benefit of the audience who may not be familiar, um, do you mind briefly describing what that process looks like and what your role is at BMS? Sure. Uh, well, it has taken me, what, 35 years or so to learn the process of drug development. I'm still learning it. Yes. Uh, but let me try and summarize it in five sentences, maybe. Um, medicines are, are made through the chemistry and by chemists. 
Uh, those are tested in first in cells, then in, in, in animals as well. And then ultimately, when they're ready to be uh, tested out in people, then we do what is called clinical trials or studies in people for a given disease. When we have adequate amount of safety data available, when we have adequate amount of efficacy data available, then we take it to the regulators, to the health authorities, to get them approved so that the prescribers can prescribe those medicines to patients who are really in need. And there are lots of diseases with very high unmet medical need. So that's the it's simplest way one can understand the drug development. With that said, as you ask about my job, my job now is to really lead that charge to optimize and accelerate the process of drug development so that we can bring these medicines that are tran transformational and they're going to really help patients who are in need. So I wanted to share something with you that uh, one of the things that I love about working at BMS is our patient-centric mission. So that got me thinking about a couple of questions for you. Um, as a scientific leader of BMS, what does your role mean to you? And do you have any particular patient stories that have impacted you in your career? Well, absolutely. Uh, I think the, 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 the drive that I have uh, is the innovation that I see all the time. And it doesn't matter whether it's cancer or immunology or cardiovascular disease or anything else. And, and the ability for every scientist and everyone who works uh, at BMS to really harness that purpose that they have and the passion that they have to help people, it truly is, is remarkable. Uh, you ask about a story, you know, as, as I went through my studies and I became a physician, saw patients, treated patients, there are a few that just stick out and they stay with you because those are the drives that you have. And th I remember treating this uh, man, 40-year-old, uh, had something called anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, a bad disease, and especially when it's metastatic or it has spread in the body, there were no good treatments available then, and there are no good treatments available even now for most of these patients. And the patient only had one desire, and he said, Doc, all I really need is if you can find a way to make me live for at least a year. I need to take care of a few things, my personal things for my family, etc." And it was a small ask, but a huge task. So with the team, we were able to bring together a regimen, and we were fortunate, truly we were fortunate, because we were able to give him that year that he was asking for. He was satisfied, he had a smile on his face when he left for the hospice where ultimately he did pass away. Now, there was one satisfaction that we were able to live up to the promise we had made for him, but there was a big hole in the heart as well that you know, this is not the way medicine should be, mm -hmm. and we need to do a lot more. We need a lot more innovation. And it's good to see that we've made a lot of progress since then. This is 20 years ago. We've now developed better medicines. We've moved from chemotherapy to antibodies to small molecule drugs to putting drugs together on top of antibodies and to cell therapies. The next big task, of course, is to be able to get these drugs to everyone in the world and not just for a selected few. Uh. Thank you for sharing that story. That, that was really powerful. I'm sure there's many others that you could share. But I, I can imagine that the audience is now wondering, is there a cure for cancer? Where are we in that journey? That is a, that is a great question, Claudia, because a lot of people ask, is there a cure for cancer? And then, you, especially when you see the headlines on, on a magazine, found a cure for cancer. But let's start by bursting a myth first. Cancer is not one disease. Cancer is an umbrella term under which a lot of cancers exist. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, cancer of the blood cells like lymphomas and leukemias and others. So we actually have to work through each of the different cancer types to start to find cures and treatments for those. While we are not there to say we've cured a, a certain cancer or not, but we've made a lot of progress in this. If you think about just about a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago, a patient with uh, melanoma, skin cancer, uh, which has spread in the body, if you think about what the longevity or the quantity of life was for that patient, it was about six months to less than a year. Where we are today, both the quantity and the quality of life has improved. 
If you think about some of the childhood cancers, uh, such as ALL, many of those kids are now treated and live a very normal and long life. With that said, though, uh, still, cancer is diagnosed at very late stages in some of the countries, especially the low- and middle-income countries. And in these countries, 70% of the kids still don't have adequate treatments. You heard this morning the statistic that is the most resounding way to say that we need more is that half the world's population doesn't even have, have health care. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done, and this is all in the service of trying to find that cure for any given cancer, let alone all cancers. You have touched on um, a little bit earlier uh, the advancements that have been made in cancer treatments. Can you elaborate a little bit more, and um, if there, are there any areas where we need to improve? Sure. So I think one of the things that has happened is with the advent of technology, with the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, uh, big data availability, with companies like Google and others releasing the structures of all the proteins, uh, with the genome being identified, the process of uh, drug discovery has accelerated. The process of drug development has accelerated. Uh, 20 years ago, we talked about chemotherapies, then came the small molecules, then came drugs that specifically targeted mutations in the genome, then came the antibodies and what we call immunotherapies, then came what we call the antibody drug conjugates, meaning the drugs on the antibodies. And some of the most promising things that we've seen recently coming out are some obviously cell therapies where you take the patient's own cells, engineer them, modify them, find the right targets, and give it back to the patients. And they are leading to really adequate and, or other uh, revolutionary treatments where the death sentences have been converted to long-term successful management of the cancer. And if we look to the future, now the mRNA technologies are coming out. You remember the whole COVID-19 vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's where the technology is based on. So a humongous amount of progress has been made. I, I always say that I'm so fortunate that I'm living in this era where I have the ability to impact so many diseases with my team uh, because the technology is available and continuing to evolve. Thank you. The science of cell therapy is definitely really interesting to me, but that's probably a topic for another forum. Um, I'd like to um, go to, uh, start discussing something that we have not touched on today, and that is access to these therapies and also health inequity. Are there any examples of health inequity that you have seen in action, and what can we do to address it? So yes, apart from finding a cure for cancer, whatever that means now for you, uh, I think one of the big problems that is to be solved is health inequity. All morning long, we heard a lot of those talks mm -hmm. that talked about health inequity. And we see it even when we do drug development in all forms of ways and all forms of life. Uh, let me talk about Argentina, for example. When we do clinical trials, not just us as in BMS, but any of the companies, most clinical trials are done in the private sector. Mm -hmm. That's where clinical trials uh, adequate infrastructures available. But if you think about Argentina, most patients are actually seen by doctors in the public setting. So we're trying to change that. We're trying to create an infrastructure where we're able to bring clinical trials to the public sector. We now live in the United States, for example. We've seen health inequity over there based on race, based on uh, gender, based on uh, ethnicity. So we are continuing to work, even with our own foundation, to train more physicians of diverse backgrounds so that they can conduct clinical trials in their communities in a proper way. Uh, we are making uh, centers available in the communities where the underrepresented minorities live. But alone, we will not be able to achieve any of that. It is all about collaboration. We all have to work together to really make a huge impact because half the world's population does not have health care. Um, health equity is truly an important point, and with so much more still to be done, what gives you hope for the future? And also, what would you say to the next generation of scientists, many of whom are probably here in the audience today? <laughs> well, I'm eternally optimistic. The glass is half full, not half empty for me. The thing that I would say to not just the scientists, but all the young folks, 
is twofold. Number one, be a good listener. If you listen, you'll see that others actually have great ideas as well. Mm -hmm. And when you combine those great ideas with your own ideas, you can be the true change maker. Number two, have the passion and have the fun in whatever you do. Because if you have the passion and the purpose and the fun in the job that you do, you can easily make the good into the great. But enough about that, and enough about you questioning me. I have a question for you too. <laughs> because you're the young one over here. What, what message do you have for, for the scientists or the young ones out there? Well, I'm a little bit biased, and I would like everyone to become a scientist. So what I would say is that if you're uh, thinking or considering science as a career, you should truly go for it. Um, science opens so many doors and so many opportunities. In my case, for example, I started wanting out to become a physician, like Summit, but then I discovered pharmaceutical sciences along the way. With that degree, I became a drug discovery scientist, and I worked for a few years at BMS doing that. And then I became curious again about business, and I pivoted into a role where I'm now, which is business development, where instead of supporting internal innovations at BMS, I now source external innovation to bring into the company and to add to our portfolio. Thank you for the question, Summit. And also, I'd like to thank you for your time today and for the candid conversation. Well, thank you, Claudia, and thank you so much. Continue to discover, continue to develop, continue to invent, because you are the change maker of the future. Thank you. <laughs>